Today we will learn and reflect on stories from the civil rights struggles of the 60s, which were a continuation of the struggles of earlier generations of black leaders and civil rights activists after the Civil War. Our primary source will be lecture notes from the Yale University undergraduate class lectures by Professor Holloway for his African American history class. These videos have a warning that the physical and sexual violence common in these years may disturb some students of history. In our prior videos on the Yale lectures on African American history, we reflected on slavery and the abolitionist movement, how the blacks were instrumental in the Civil War struggle to abolish slavery, how the civil rights reforms of Reconstruction were undone by the institution of the Jim Crow legal system that denied blacks the right to vote, the right to due process, the right to true equality under the law, and the early civil rights struggles before the 1960s civil rights era. The Union soldiers may have won the battles of the Civil War, but the true Civil War to change racial attitudes, this is a war that's being fought to this very day. At the end of our talk, we'll discuss the sources used for our video. Please feel free to follow along in the PowerPoint script we uploaded to SlideShare. Please, we welcome interesting questions in the comments. Let us learn and reflect together. And we will be retelling the best stories from the lecture notes from the Yale University undergraduate class lectures by Professor Holloway. And we'll start with the story of the murder of teenager Emmett Till. Professor Holloway tells us, especially brutal is the story of Emmett Till, a 14-year-old boy, and you can see his picture, so he was a youngster, sent from Chicago to stay with his family in Mississippi. The allegation is that he whistled one day at a white storekeeper's wife when she walked past. Others have countered saying that he had a stutter and would often lisp as a result. That night he's abducted and beaten. One of his eyes is gouged out. He is wrapped in barbed wire and tied to farm equipment before being thrown over a bridge. When the authorities find him, his body is sent surreptitiously up to Chicago. His mother insists on having an open casket funeral and the images shock the country. Mose Wright, Emmett Till's uncle, points out in court the people who came to get Emmett Till from him, which meant that he could no longer live in Mississippi. Professor Holloway continues, I was having lunch from a former colleague from rural Louisiana, and the subject of Emmett Till came up. He said he was 14 or 15 years old when Emmett Till was murdered, and he knew then that he had to leave the South as soon as he could. He knew that there was no hope for a black man in the Deep South. Now there was a court case. It was an all-white, all-male jury. The jury deliberates for a whole 67 minutes. One juror said later, it wouldn't have taken so long if they hadn't stopped to get a soda. The jury finds the defendants not guilty, although everybody knew who did it. Melba Beals, who would be one of the brave black teenagers of the Little Rock Nine, who ran the racist gauntlets daily to integrate Central High, tells a horrific story from when she was only 12 years old. Professor Holloway tells us, the day the Supreme Court hands down the Brown v. Board of Education ruling overturning the Plessy v. Ferguson notion of separate but equal, mandating desegregation in American schools, Melba's teachers warn their black students, go straight home, don't take any shortcuts, just go straight home. And Melba would discover the reason for this warning. Melba writes in her memoir, as I entered the persimmon field, and this is a picture of a persimmon field, I sank deep into my thoughts, but a few steps past the big tree at the front of the path, I heard a rustling sound. I stood perfectly still, looking all around. I didn't see a soul. Suddenly, as I came near to the end of the field, a man's gravel voice snatched me from the secret place in my head. You want a ride, girl? He didn't sound at all like anybody I knew. There it was again, the stranger's voice calling out to me. You want a ride, girl? Who is it? I asked, barely able to squeeze the words out. I got candy in my car, lots of candy. I crept forward and then I saw him, a big white man, even taller than my father, broad and huge like a wrestler. He was coming towards me fast. I had turned on my heels and fled in the opposite direction, back the way I had come. You'd better come on and take a ride home, you hear me, girl? No, sir, I yelled. No, thank you. But he kept coming. And Melba says this. My heart was racing almost as fast as my feet. 
I couldn't hear anything except for the sound of my saddle shoes pounding the ground and the thud of his feet close behind me. That's when he started talking about niggers wanting to go to school with his children and how he wasn't going to stand for it. And Melba continues. My cries for help drowned out the sound of his words, but he laughed and said it was no use because nobody would hear me. I was running as fast as I could. The lace on my shoes came untied and my feet got tangled. As I hit the ground, I bit down hard on my tongue. I felt his strong hands clutch my back. I bolted up, struggling to get away. This nightmare continues. He pulled me down and turned me on my back. I looked up into his face, looming close above me like a monster on a movie screen. I struggled against him, but he was too strong. He slapped me hard across the face. I covered my eyes with my hands and waited for him to strike me again. Instead, I felt him squirm against me. Then I saw him taking his pants down. Now in my house, private parts were always kept private. I couldn't figure out what he was doing, but I knew it had to be bad. I scratched and kicked and thrashed against him with every ounce of strength I could muster. His huge fists smashed hard against my face. I struggled to push him back and to keep the dark curtain of unconsciousness from descending over me. The big white brute shouted, I'll show you niggers the Supreme Court can't ruin my life, he said as his hand ripped at my underpants. A voice inside my head told me I was going to die, but there was nothing I could do about it. White men were in charge. Professor Holloway then tells us, someone comes to her rescue within about four or five seconds of this moment before she's actually raped. One of her classmates, she didn't really know that well, knocks the guy over the head with a brick and she's able to escape to safety. This begins her journey towards becoming one of the Little Rock Nine. These are the memories of a 12-year-old girl. Now, the Supreme Court of Brown ruled that school districts had to be desegregated with all deliberate speed, which in the Deep South means never. A few years later, the NAACP selects nine students to integrate Little Rock Central High in 1957. And this painting titled The Problem We All Live With is painted by Norman Rockwell in that era. Professor Holloway tells us, The NAACP is focusing on Arkansas because it seemed to be one of the most progressive states in the South on these issues. The nine who were selected were amazing students, academically gifted, coming from the right families, who comported themselves in the right way. But there's fierce local resistance. The governor, Orville Faubus, calls in the Arkansas National Guard to prevent integration. Now, President Eisenhower, very unhappy about the whole scene, sends in the 101st Airborne to force the issue. And he does it not because he believed in integration, but because he believed in the federal government's right to assert itself. This is a state's right issue versus federal rights issue for Eisenhower. The troops ushered in the students after they had already tried to integrate the school before but were harassed by mobs outside the building. The troops would go with the students up to the door of the classroom, but in the classroom, or in the bathroom, or in the cafeteria, all hell broke loose. One student had a lie thrown in her face and was almost permanently blinded. They were attacked, books were thrown down, food poured on them, but they could not respond. The one student who did respond got kicked out, at which point they said, well, one nigger down, eight more to go, trying to get these students out of the school. Houses were bombed, people were shot at, folks lost their jobs. Now think about all this. What's being asked of these children, and they are children, and Professor Holloway continues with this nightmare. Going back to Melba Beals, there's a few items from her diary entry, New Year's Day in 1958, that allow us to ask some pretty important questions. Four different items selected from a longer list is one, to behave in a way that pleases mother and grandma, two people who are very central in her life, to keep faith and understand more of how Gandhi behaved when his life was really hard, to pray daily for the strength not to fight back. And the resolution that she put as number one was this, to do my best to stay alive until May 29th, the end of the school year. I mean, think about it. NAACP activists, grown men and women, are making sure that the children stay in school despite the violence they suffer. And it's very fair to ask, is it appropriate for 16-year-olds to feel the need to write in their diaries that the most important New Year's resolution is to do my best to stay alive until the end of the school year? What are the adults asking these children to do for the sake of the movement? Now one final note about the school year in Little Rock. The governor was so upset about the public relations disaster that accompanied the school's desegregation that he decided to shut down Little Rock Public Schools the next year. 
the integration of the school, this great moment of civil rights victory of American exceptionalism lasted one year, and then the public schools were shut down. And there's another story of this era that I was not really aware of that appeared in the political magazine, The Ugly Backlash to Brown versus Board of Education that no one talks about. And this is an excerpt from an article for someone who wrote a book about this topic. There's plenty that we have not been taught about Brown, decided seven decades ago, and how it continues to impact us. We know about Linda Brown and Ruby Ridges and the other brave students crossing the colored line. But what we don't know about are the 100,000 exceptionally credentialed black principals and teachers illegally purged from desegregating schools in the wake of Brown. Now we'll have the story of the Freedom Bus Riders. And Professor Holloway tells us in 1961, CORE, or the Congress of Racial Equality, organizes a new round of Freedom Rides. Members of SNCC, students from Yale and other places in Connecticut, jump on these integrated buses and head on south. Once they cross into the deep south, the buses are attacked by smoke bombs. Tires are slashed. As people run out of the buses to get away from the smoke, they are met by mobs who beat them with their fists and metal poles. The buses are torched. Other buses are sent down. And we see pictures of the Freedom Riders arrested for protesting, Professor Holloway tells us. Eventually, the buses arrive in Birmingham, Alabama, where Bull O'Connor, the Commissioner of Public Safety, knows they're coming, knows there's a mob waiting for them at the bus station, and does not offer police protection. He lets the students and riders get beaten senseless for 15 minutes before releasing the police. Then people said, why did you do such a thing? He goes, it was Mother's Day. You can't take a man away from his mother. You know they needed to have time spent with their mother. You know they would get there in time. And also famous is the story about Martin Luther in the Birmingham jail. Professor Holloway says, King comes to Birmingham and willfully gets arrested. He knows he's going to be arrested. He's trying to brew up crisis. They throw King into solitary. There's no word coming from him. This is actually terrifying. This is an era when people would disappear, and King, being such a high-profile person, was not protected from disappearing. His wife, Coretta Scott King, is frantic wanting to at least get reassurance that her husband is alive. Not just safe, but alive. President Kennedy gets involved and seeks guarantees of King's safety. While King is in jail, a number of moderate white clergy in Birmingham are upset that King is coming in from out of town stirring up trouble. They publish a newspaper ad telling King to slow things down, to calm down, to lower the temperature. King responds by writing one of the great protest documents and letters, and that's the letter from Birmingham Jail, one of the most important documents in American protest history. In his letter from the Birmingham Jail, Martin Luther King persuasively exclaims, We have waited for more than 340 years for our constitutional and God-given rights. The nations of Asia and Africa are moving with jet-like speed towards gaining political independence, but we creep at a horse and buggy pace toward gaining a cup of coffee at a lunch counter. Perhaps it is easy for those who have never felt the stinging darts of segregation to say, wait. Martin Luther King tells us then of the vicious treatment of blacks in the Deep South, which was similar to the cruelties and persecutions the Jews faced in the Holocaust. But when you have seen vicious mobs lynch your mothers and fathers at will and drown your sisters and brothers at whim, when you have seen hate-filled policemen curse, kick, and even kill your black brothers and sisters, when you see the vast majority of your 20 million Negro brothers smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society, then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. King continues, But when you suddenly find your tongue twisted and your speech stammering as you seek to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she can't go to the public amusement park, and see tears welling up in her eyes when she is told that Funtown is closed to colored children, and see ominous clouds of inferiority beginning to form in her little mental sky, and see her beginning to distort her personality by developing an unconscious bitterness towards white people, when you have to concoct an answer for a five-year-old son who is asking, Daddy, why do white men treat colored people so mean? Then you'll understand why we find it difficult to wait. And he continues in his letter from a Birmingham jail, when you take a cross-country drive and find it necessary to sleep night after night in the uncomfortable corners of your automobile because no motel will accept you. When you're humiliated day in and day out by nagging signs reading white and colored. When your first name becomes nigger, your middle name becomes boy, however old you are, and your last name becomes John, 
and your wife and mother are never given the respected title Mrs. When you are harried by day and haunted by night by the fact that you are a Negro, living in constantly a tiptoe stance, never quite knowing what to expect next, and are plagued with inner fears and outer resentments, when you are forever fighting a degenerating sense of nobodiness, then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. There comes a time when the cup of endurance runneth over, and men are no longer willing to be plunged into the abyss of despair. Professor Holloway says, What's the pace of change? It's going too fast for white moderates. Not merely fast enough for African Americans and white activists. So King writes the letter from Birmingham jail over Easter weekend in 1963. Meanwhile, marches are being organized in Birmingham, organized from 16th Street Baptist Church, to try to call attention to the general plight that African Americans face in Birmingham, the injustice, injustice of the situation. Professor Holloway continues, Bull Connor responds quite famously, I want to see the dogs work and then look at these niggers run. As the marches are organized, he would release the dogs. You've seen the images, of course. Open up the fire cannons. They actually had a tank, a police tank, that was brought out to terrorize the citizens. A decision is made by King in a circle to raise the stakes. And by raising the stakes, that means using children in the marches. By the end of the first day, children marching in defiance of orders, leaving school. A thousand children aged between 6 and 18 years old are thrown in jail. By the next day, the number doubles. Robert F. Kennedy, he was leading a civil rights agenda for his brother, John F. Kennedy. Robert F. Kennedy is beside himself. He could not believe that King would risk these children's lives, as he put it, for the sake of more media coverage and more negative press. And that's what he was doing, there's no doubt about it that King is trying to antagonize the situation and horrify the nation by revealing what Bull Connor would actually do. And Bull Connor took the bait. He doesn't care. Birmingham becomes a media circus, as people from around the country are horrified what they bear witness to. With all the media around, a truce is negotiated. Lunch counters open to blacks. They become integrated. Promises are made that blacks are going to be hired in clerical and sales positions, thus avoiding economic boycotts. But that doesn't mean that there is peace. Martin Luther King's brother's house is bombed, and the hotel that was a staging ground for a lot of the organizers who were coming in from out of town, that hotel was bombed. Federal troops, Robert F. Kennedy convinces his brother, you've got to bring federal troops if you want to have stability. So federal troops come and occupy Birmingham to keep the peace. And at this time, Martin Luther King delivers his famous speech, I Have a Dream. Martin Luther King gave this speech on the March on Washington again at the Lincoln Memorial. So even though we face difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Of course, that's from Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. I have a dream that one day the Red Hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners, we'll be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering in the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. Later in this speech, he says, in a sense, we've come to our nation's capital to cash a check. The architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. They were signing a promissory note to which every America was to fall heir. This note was a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of law, of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note insofar as her citizens of color are concerned. Instead of honoring the sacred obligation, America has given the Negro a bad check, a check which has come back marked insufficient funds. And further in the speech, Martin Luther King says this, We can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the victim of unspeakable horrors of police brutality. We can never be satisfied as long as our bodies, heavy with the fatigue of travel, cannot gain lodging in the motels of the highways and the hotels of the cities. We cannot be satisfied as long as the Negro's basic mobility is from a smaller ghetto to a larger ghetto. 
We can never be satisfied as long as our children are stripped of their selfhood and robbed of their dignity by signs stating, for whites only. We cannot be satisfied as long as a Negro in Mississippi cannot vote, and a Negro in New York believes he has nothing for which to vote. No, no, we are not satisfied, and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. And about this time, we also have the March on Selma, Alabama, Professor Holloway tells us. The situation in Dallas County, where Selma is located, is really quite astonishing. In Dallas County, out of 15,000 who are registered to vote, only 350 are black. And this is in a state with a majority black population. In Alabama in general, over three quarters of eligible blacks are still off the voting rolls, the highest percentage in the South. So Martin Luther King goes down there to announce a new voter registration drive, knowing that he could bait the sheriff pretty easily. Rallies are organized, marches are planned. In the middle of February, a peaceful SCLC rally in a neighboring area was attacked by the police. During the melee, 26-year-old Jimmy Lee Jackson shields his mother who's being beaten by a state trooper, and he's shot in the stomach and dies. Of course, the police account differs. But this happens in front of news cameras, and several reporters from NBC are also attacked. Professor Holloway continues, a plan evolves immediately to march from Selma, where Jimmy Lee Jackson was murdered, from Selma to Montgomery, the state capital, 50 miles away. On March 7th, the chairman of the SNCC, John Lewis, leads a march of 600 protesters over the Edmund Pettus Bridge. The disruption of the march when the police beats the protesters is captured on live TV and shown across the nation. Thousands flocked to Selma as a protest was announced. We will march again from across the country. Black, white, it doesn't matter. They all come to Selma to right this injustice. This day becomes known as Bloody Sunday. And another little-known story about the second more peaceful Selma march is that of a grandmother who was shuttling march participants back to the beginning point. While she was driving her station wagon, some good old boys pulled up beside her, windows rolled down, and blew her away with a shotgun. And we also have in the Freedom Summer, the Freedom Summer Murders. And during the summer of 1964, activists were in Mississippi encouraging local blacks to register to vote. Three young activists, two white, one black, traveled to the town of Longwood to talk to a congregation about setting up a freedom school to assist with voter registration. When they did not call in at the agreed upon time that afternoon, they were reported missing. Their smoldering car was found and reported to the FBI. Local law enforcement said they knew nothing. This became a national story. LBJ ordered 400 Navy divers to search the canals of Mississippi LBJ was likely not surprised when the divers were unable to find the bodies of the three missing boys, but they did find the bodies of six other Mississippi blacks who were likely victims of other lynchings. Perhaps some locals were worried that other bodies of lynched blacks would be discovered because they provided the FBI a helpful tip. The lynch mob who murdered the youngsters included the local sheriff and other members of the local KKK chapter. Only the black kid was beaten but all three kids were shot and buried in an earthen dam by a backhoe. Autopsies indicated that one of the kids had dirt in his lungs, which meant that he had been buried alive. And this is from a painting and sketch by Norman Rockwell, Murder in Mississippi. So now we'll tell the story of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And the illustration is from a century ago when blacks were last able to vote in large numbers in the Reconstruction era. Professor Holloway tells us, in the summer of 1965, LBJ is going out on a limb to become the civil rights president. On August 6th of 1965, he signs the Voting Rights Act, after an incredible effort to get it through. And the Voting Rights Act prohibited states from imposing literacy requirements as obstacles for accessing the ballot box. It's the most successful way of cutting out the vote. And most importantly, it allowed the Attorney General to send federal examiners in to any election where they thought voting rights might be curtailed. Professor Holloway continues, The Voting Rights Act does not give anybody the right to vote. It gives the federal government the authority to protect the right to vote. It brings into bold relief the federal government's ability and right to supersede in local affairs, which has been the nut of the bone of contention since the Civil Rights Act was passed. And Professor Holloway tells us, the Voting Rights Act has, if you look forward from the moment of its passage, makes a clear change. 
Within four years of its passage, three-fifths of adult blacks are registered to vote. It's an astonishing shift. Between 1964 and 1969, the number of registered black voters in Alabama goes from less than 20% to over 60% of the population. In Mississippi, it goes from less than 7% to over two-thirds of the population within five years. It's a seismic shift, especially when you consider the numbers. The numbers we're talking about in terms of the African-American population. And Professor Holloway tells us, in New York City, there was the very famous Central Park jogger case. A white woman goes out jogging in Central Park at night. She's an investment banker. She's attacked by teenage boys. The press likened the boys to a roving pack of wolves. Donald Trump takes out full-page ads calling for the death penalty. The mayor refers to them as monsters. Thirteen years later, in 2002, Matthias Reyes confesses to raping the young woman, and his DNA matched. This is another instance of profound police ineptitude, because they had this guy the whole time essentially, and the young men who were kind of raising hell in Central Park, they weren't rapists. Many of them languished behind bars for quite some time. Who would forget the story of Rodney King? And Professor Holloway not only tells us the story of Rodney King's beating, but also the stories behind the story. The Rodney King beating took place in 1991. Rodney King, sky high on drugs, engages in a high-speed chase with the LA Police Department. The police are upset. The police arrest Rodney King and they also beat him, too enthusiastically. Rodney King suffers a fractured skull, a broken leg, and internal injuries. The Rodney King beating makes media history because a bystander records the brutal beating on a video camera, which is played over and over on the news. Bowing to public pressure, two weeks later, four police officers are charged with assault, but the jury acquits them, sparking six days of riots. Professor Holloway continues, during these riots occurs the story of Reginald Denny. Reginald Denny, a white guy, hears that his friends are in trouble, caught near the vortex of the riot. He's going to go help them. He's a truck driver. But his truck is stopped, and some thugs pull him out, and they start beating him with a brick, trying to kill him. TV cameras are focusing on these black guys attacking the innocent white truck driver. And I might add, the camera crews are not trying to help him at all. What most people don't realize is the fact that the people who saved Danny are some older blacks who saw this happening on TV, knew the intersection, got in their car and drove over to save them. Saved him and took him to the hospital. Later King was telling people afterwards, you know, quit using me as a political football. I don't want to be used in this way. Stop it. But he had lost control over his own virtual projected image and was unable to stop the riots. You might ask, what was accomplished in this struggle for civil rights? The issues of slavery, abolition, emancipation, and black civil rights have dominated American politics since the 1830s. These racial issues continue to dominate our politics up to the current day, causing the shift of Southern and other conservative white voters from the Democratic Party to the Republican Party as the fulfillment of Nixon's Southern strategy. From the 1830s to the 1870s, abolitionists and radical Republicans, with help from the black slaves, strove and struggled for black Americans to share in the American dream, shedding the blood of thousands and thousands on the battlefields of the Civil War, only to temporarily give up the struggle, allowing white supremacists and the KKK to take control of the South. And so it was accomplished. Eric Foner, the renowned Civil War historian, notes that at least black Americans gained their personal dignity. Nobody owned them anymore. Blacks did not have to work in gangs under the whip of an overseer, they were allowed to marry at the courthouse. Black families would not be broken up at a moment's notice, as happened so often during slavery. Throughout the 20th century, black civil rights leaders never gave up. Eleanor Roosevelt, with FDR and other liberals, were able to make many small advances during the time of the Depression and World War II. These civil rights gains accelerated when the Civil Rights Acts restored the rights of blacks to vote and restored their other rights, like due process. Under the Jim Crow regime, intermarriage was condemned as miscagenation and was illegal in many states. In the decades following the Supreme Court decision overturning these Jim Crow miscagenation statutes, intermarriage has become common. Slavery is not dead. Slavery may never die in America. We are guilty of condoning slavery when our minimum wage workers, working a full 40 hours, do not even earn enough to buy decent food, decent clothes, and have a decent roof over the heads of their family. Now, who cares if we have freedom of speech and freedom of worship if you're starving in the streets? FDR, when we were fighting the fascists in World War II, 
in his Four Freedoms, proclaimed that everyone in the world should also enjoy freedom from want and freedom from fear. And the most basic freedom is the freedom from fear of lynching in the hope that, in America, we never go back to the days when blacks could be lynched with impunity, when the local sheriffs and deputies condoned or participated in the lynchings. Now we'll discuss the sources we use from this video. Jonathan Hallway was a Yale professor whose chosen academic field is black history, a topic he chose as a teenager. These are his undergraduate lectures on African American history. And most of his lectures cover the history of Jim Crow in the Civil Rights Era after Reconstruction. Professor David Blight's lectures for the Civil War and Reconstruction Era covered the years 1845 to 1877, so they preceded the period of this video, but he was a good source for our first three videos on this topic. One Dream has released in 2022 a video on civil rights through the years of Jim Crow. We also have a video of civil rights through paintings that also uses the One Dream course on conventional Civil War history by Thomas Gallagher. And we have another video that documents how the Nazi lawyers studied the Jim Crow legal system when drafting the Nuremberg race laws leading to the persecution of the Jews under Hitler, providing that there is a distinct link between white supremacy and Nazism. The YouTube description includes a link to our PowerPoint script that we uploaded to SlideShare and also our blog. Please support this channel by sharing this video with your friends and by clicking on the like and subscribe buttons and by clicking on the Amazon links to purchase any of the books we discussed, which will earn us a very small affiliate commission. And please consider becoming a patron of our channel. Plus, we will host special discussion groups for our patrons. Plus, you can click on the Meetup or small M icon to participate in our online discussions where we practice our future YouTube scripts. And please click on the links for other videos that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul.